it has frequently been necessary to reappraise the purposes of the mystical and other secret societies which came into existence in the late 16th and early 17th century in Europe and in the British Isles. This applies perhaps especially to the Society of the Rosy Cross. There has been an extensive literature about this organization and its objectives have been subject to, this, uh, to analysis and controversy for a very long time. This morning we want to try to point out uh, certain elements of this situation and see if we can find a useful meaning by which our present mode of life can be advanced in some way. There are a great many persons today who have deep respect for these post-Reformation organizations. And this respect should lead to the development of an appropriate utility. We should try to find out how respect can be transformed from a static veneration to a dynamic application of principles. So we'll begin now with this original problem relating to the Society of the Rosy Cross, or as it is more generally known today, the Rosicrucians. There is every evidence in their original writing that these mystics belong directly to the descent of the Protestant Reformation. They stem from the basic ideas of Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon, the presumed author of the original works of the society, the fame and confession of the Rosy Cross, was a Lutheran theologian by the name of Johann Valentin Andre. This man admitted posthumously among his papers were found the statements that he was the author of these manifestos. While this, of course, is still not accepted by some, evidence to sustain it is not only historical but internal within the works themselves. The original purpose of these manifestos, as first issued to the world about the year 1614, the original purpose was what was termed a reformation, a universal motion of peoples toward a more adequate way of life. As we examine the manifestos themselves, we find very little relating to what we would term mysticism or metaphysics. The manifestos are clearly directed against religion, philosophy, and science. They have to do with the correction of obvious evils then existing then burdening and afflicting the body of learning and retarding the motions of progress. The original authors were moderate utopians. That is, they definitely believed that a better world could be fashioned by man for his own improvement and the progress of his kind. They also were impelled to accept but about the beginning of the 17th century, there was an important point in the historical descent of human growth and progress, which made this a very vital era, one in which certain important changes could be achieved, changes which previously would have been premature. <clears throat> Therefore, these moderate utopians, went to work to expound their concept of life. They affirmed that at an earlier date, 
their mysterious leader and founder, whose true identity has not yet been completely uh, solved, prepared a vast work, an encyclopedia, or a compendium of all worldly knowledge. The purpose of this work was to reconcile all arts and sciences, to, re to recognize the common indebtedness of learning to divine wisdom, and that a holistic or complete concept of learning must be restored. They therefore attempted to bind the wounds caused by the divisions within science, philosophy, and religion. This concept would have been impossible of clear statement prior to the Reformation. And the Reformation, with its increasing emphasis upon humanism, is also re reflected in the Rosicrucian manifestos. For now we find man himself emerging as the instrument for the perfection of his own destiny. The man of the Middle Ages accepted no personal responsibility for his world. The glorious civilization, which we call the Renaissance, was composed of persons sincerely believing, at least affirming, that the destiny of the world was totally in the keeping of God. The human being was to live as he could. Certainly he was supposed to be a moral, spiritual, and upright being. But these virtues were for his own salvation as an individual. If he kept the rules, if he attended the church regularly, if he performed or was conducted periodically through the sacraments, then his own destiny was assured. Collective destiny, the common good of the common man, came to no consideration whatsoever. On the level of sciences also, there was no indoctrination of common responsibility. The entire system was individualistic and highly competitive. The Rosicrucian Manifestos, therefore, give us the, one of the first articulate statements of humanism. Not humanism in our contemporary sense, but in the classical meaning of the word. Here we find man deciding that if he wants a better world, he will have to build it. Now this is a very practical decision, and one that confronts us even today, after the passing of nearly 400 years. To build a better world meant that man must know more. And the building of a democratic way of life required universal education. To accomplish universal education, therefore, knowledge must be brought to the average person. And it must be brought to him in a way that was dynamic and useful. The Rosicrucian manifestos affirm, in spirit if not in actual letter, that the individual who is to become the citizen of the new age must not only be instructed in ancient arts and sciences and in all practical crafts and trades, he must be indoctrinated with the concept of cooperation. He must work not for himself alone, alone, but for the good of all. He must build not only a selfish success, but he must share in the molding of a collective security. To do this, he must have ideals, because the only weapon and instrument against selfishness is idealism. He must also be given certain practical facts. It must be made obvious to him that the experience of history and of time support, uh, supports this perspective, makes it valid, and shows why it must necessarily be applied to existing conditions. Thus we find among the early 
writers and apologists of Rosicrucianism, uh, emphasis upon certain particular subjects, one which required apparently much thought at that time was the reformation of the art of medicine. We therefore find Maya writing his work on the rules of the fraternity of the Rosy Cross. Michael Maya was one who has long been assumed to be a part of the original circle that created the society. He was contemporary with its manifestos and wrote extensively upon the activities of the order. His study of the rules uh, consists principally of the setting forth of the scientific aspect of the society's program. This program was founded upon the responsibility of medicine the responsibility of protecting the public and private health. There was much emphasis upon need for the further refinement and improvement of scientific knowledge on the field or on the level of healing. There were also moral obligations which the physician must accept, and it was taken for granted that the physicians of the time who belonged to the fraternity of the Rosy Cross were practicing these virtues in the ways set forth. One of the primary uh, objectives, which was more or less an extension of Moore's utopia, was the Rosicrucian concept of a kind of state medicine. They held it to be the inalienable right of every man to have the advantages of total scientific knowledge. There were trades and professions in which persons certainly had every right uh, to advance their own profits in any reasonable and honorable manner. But one of the early concepts of humanism, based upon Moore's utopian vision, and sustained by Andre and his Christianopolis, was that those things absolutely necessary to the security, happiness, health, and well-being of people must be available to all. Now, of course, in the early 17th century, this was a cataclysmic pronouncement, a pronouncement which still causes a shudder in society. We are not yet quite willing to face it. But these mystics, so-called, were very practical people. And they held that the increase in the practice of medicine should be regarded as part of religion. If, therefore, one became a member of what was then called the God-enlightened fraternity of R.C., he must make some religious contribution. If he was a doctor, it was his religious duty, therefore, to set aside a certain part of his practice for the healing of the sick who were too poor to pay. They must have equal attention, equal consideration, and he must perform this act as one of religious service. It must be his way of prayer, his way of proving that he was a true Christian gentleman. The advancement of knowledge also concerned these people, because as you can well imagine, in those days, the medical arts were rather primitive. The need for broadening the horizon of medicine was also pointed out and the need to break through scientifically the isolation set up by the medievalism of European religion. These brethren of the Rosy Cross anticipated by about 50 years the rise of the Royal Society of England. In this Royal Society, for the first time, savants in various fields decided to break through all national and racial boundaries. 
and among the early papers of the Royal Society were articles on the medicine of India, the medicines of China. And of course, the uh, Rosicrucians, with their peculiar heritage, were concerned with the medical policies of the Near East, the work of the Muslim physicians, the work being done in Spain by the Moors, and various outside sources of knowledge were to be regarded with favor and consideration. This breaking through was based upon the common concept that science is essentially concerned with care for the needs of man as a physical creature. Therefore, the true scientist must advance his end regardless of all other considerations so long as that advancement has as its real and honest purpose the healing of the sick. These thoughts then become rather prominent and positive for the time in which they flourish. On a philosophical level, there is every evidence uh, that Rosicrucianism was indebted to the Neoplatonism of Alexandria and the Hermetic philosophy of the later Egyptians. Although there is much reference to the Arabs in the original treatises dealing with the society, there is comparatively little Arabian or Muslim philosophy to be found in the early writings of the order. These writings are essentially Protestant Christian writings. References to other matters are sketchy at best and show very little uh, impress upon the general policies of the order. It was true, however, that among these scholars and savants and thinkers, mystics, there was a strong tendency to restore a certain type of religious mysticism which had come under heavy pressure during the Reformation. The outward trend of the Reformation was distinctly toward what we call Puritanism. The uh, liberated Christian faith became a rather severe, colorless doctrine. Nearly all art and music were lost. And with the coming of the Reformation, religious theater was lost. Rituals, rites, ceremonies, all these almost totally vanished, and in their place was a kind of dour, tenacious orthodoxy that was not especially attractive nor especially consoling. It was therefore part of the Rosicrucian concept to create, out of the ruins of what had gone before, a powerful Protestant mysticism. This mysticism was not only obviously in line with a more profound study of man, but it was a crying need of the people. In those days, religion was perhaps a far more vital factor in the life of the average person than it is today. The medieval community uh, existed around the church. The church was not only the religious center, it was the focal point for the whole community life. Very often the guilds met in the church. Most of the religious entertainment and drama centered around the church. And to these smaller communities, there was really no other common ground of contact and communion. That this should be preserved in some way that man should discover in his faith not only a source of respect, but also a powerful element of inspiration. These things, these values, were recognized as essential. Thus we have emerging within or through the structure of Rosicrucianism the restoration of a mystical tradition. This mystical tradition, as they presented it, was heavily symbolized by alchemy and by the hermetic arts. 
drawing upon the mystical schools rising from classical thinking, the Rosicrucians therefore emphasized the possibility of man's direct personal experience of divinity. Protestant mysticism became a more or less individualistic experience. It was an experience in which the individual was assumed to possess the power and the inclination to transcend orthodoxy. He might leave his church after a long and interminable sermon of an exceedingly dull nature and completely literal and orthodox. He was then to go into his own life and enrich himself out of the convictions that he found there. If the sermon was especially dull, he perhaps should think about it again in order to discover, if possible, some better interpretation that could be transformed into a vital impulse in his own life. Interpretation, therefore, became a private problem, for early Protestantism was also burdened with a very literal uh, hierarchy of believers and beliefs, not easily inclined to be liberal or to broaden their perspectives. Religion then began to take form as a personal mysticism. And this came into expression through the uh, broad and fantastic symbolism of alchemy. We know that the alchemical speculations of the Rosy Cross were symbolical. We have no evidence whatever that these philosophers in their true and proper guise were ever concerned with the manufacturing of gold. Such a procedure would have been extremely inconsistent with the simple Christian piety that dominated the order. These uh, m mystics were dedicated to humble living, to escape from all pretension. They were supposed to remain unknown, even in the regions where they dwelt. They could make no claims, and they could solicit no membership. They were supposed to be recognized only, if at all, because of the good deeds which they performed. Such a concept would hardly sustain an elaborate, literal, alchemical uh, program. Thus, under the alchemy of transmutation, they certainly were concerned with the transforming of society. They hoped to create a strong enough group to spearhead the coming of the modern way of life. They were perhaps a little more successful than the average person of today realizes. So under alchemy and other mystical themes, they concealed their essential purpose of preserving man from the various corruptions and restrictions and limitations of ignorance, superstition, and fear. They were resolved to transform society, working quietly and patiently from within, and using the primary means which the classic world had set up, namely universal freedom through universal knowledge. In addition to these speculations, <clears throat> we certainly find them uh, working with the application of philosophy uh, to the various fields of human endeavor. We know that they spread out under the surface of European thought encouraging the rise of an age of reason. They began to emphasize the importance of individuals thinking things through, that man could not live for a day or a time. He was part of a motion that went on down through the ages. And this building of a better world was like the perfection of a great house or temple. Each generation made its contribution, departed, and left the unfinished labor to the future. Thus, out of this concept also came the concept of building, 
of long-range programming. Several things are said to have contributed to this, perhaps some of them defensive, for Europe had not so long before passed through its tremendous spiritual crisis of becoming aware that there was more to the world than Europe. Up to the time of uh, the first voyages of the explorers and the uh, immediate reactions from the Crusades and from the great invasions of the uh, Mongol conquerors, up to those times, the Dark Ages and early medieval world, Europe was an island in space. Europe was as isolated as 18th century China. Europe had no sense of dependence upon anything outside of itself. Whatever world there was beyond Europe perhaps was of interest to traders and merchants, but it had no special value. There was no concept of world unity, or the need for it, or even the possibility of it. Yet step by step, circumstances and conditions forced the world upon Europe. The comparatively dismal results of the Crusades produced a tremendous reaction in Europe. Europe suddenly recognized itself not to be um, alone. It was no longer infallible. It was quite possible to assume that the world outside of Europe was strong. Strong enough, perhaps, even to conquer Europe. Thinking of this kind was almost heresy in those days. But then came the great developments of the rise of the Mongol Empire under Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan, and Timur Shah. These great Asiatic leaders moved down from the mysterious depths of Gobi, crossed Central Asia, and thundered at the gates of Christendom. Essentially, this tremendous motion of Asia was irresistible. It was only by a series of extremely fortuitous circumstances that Europe was preserved. This had a considerable, considerable effect upon European thinking. The third factor that may have had a powerful influence was the development of the Western Hemisphere. The discovery that there was an entire continent west of Europe, previously unknown, and that between Europe and Asia was a new world. This new world was at the time we are referring to, the early 17th century, in the process of being divided up among ambitious European powers, with Spain strongly leading in its demand for acceptance and recognition. All of these circumstances threw man into the recognition of a larger world, for the first time, he was forced to think, not merely of his own small place in things, but to recognize the enormous pressures which were around him, which could close in upon him. Also, the need for larger planning within his own group, the need to meet the challenge of, a, of an intelligent program of colonization for the Western world. At the same time, the, the loss of the infallibility of the church through the Reformation threw him into a spiritual emergency. And he suddenly realized that he had to stand on his own feet, that he had to make decisions, and that these decisions would have to be made more wisely than had previously been the case. With the Reformation also, and with all these changes, the power of the state was strongly undermined. The infallibility, the divine right of kings, was beginning to dim. And the individual began to criticize government, and criticize it heartily and wholeheartedly. 
This removed other strong protections which had previously made it unnecessary for him to arrive at definite personal decisions. He was emerging as a person. Humanity was being born as an individual. And in this emergency, man had to create new resources or redirect old resources in order to meet the challenge of the time. Possibly there was no greater source in those days of an integrated program to meet this than the rise of these secret societies, which were, of course, uh, more or less hidden because of the powerful adversaries which surrounded them. It was not a day when man could express himself, dared to show his real intentions. Yet these intentions were not only real, but absolutely necessary to the survival of Europe. So united and dedicated persons with perspective, with individual initiative, and with some philosophical insight into the great pattern unfolding around them, naturally gathered in groups, shared their common knowledge, and planned the various strategies by which their purposes would be advanced. Out of this general strategy emerged the um, inductive philosophy of Lord Bacon and the Cartesian system of René Descartes. Out of it also came the coming of the public school system under Comenius. And one by one, the ancient boundaries and barriers were broken. The idea of pansophic education was emphasized. The need for the universal thinker. The need to produce a race of beings with the breadth and penetration of Leonardo da Vinci. The security of the world depended heavily upon the proper conditioning of the individual to bear the burden of his own freedom. These things were in almost certainty uh, the essential ideas behind the original Rosicrucian order. These ideals have more or less been submerged and they have been now overlarded with a heavy metaphysical uh, atmosphere. But the original purposes were far more definite and distinct that in the advancement of these purposes, they certainly passed into mystical speculation, we know. But this speculation was utilitarian. It was to give support and definition to the principal purposes of the society. In the direct descent of this thinking, we find men like Jacob Bamey and Claude St. Martin. We have a number of alchemical mystics. We have hermetic philosophers and idealistic Gnostic scientists. All this the more important because in those days, science was still strongly influenced by religious and spiritual equations. This could have had a very interesting effect upon things and uh, did lead the way to the rise of Comenius with the first formularized concept of what was necessary in education. Now, I think this becomes, for the moment, of more practical interest to us for the simple reason that the average person today must decide for himself his own educational requirements. The belief, for example, that we can depend completely upon a formula bestowed upon us by tradition is already seriously undermined. We recognize that this formula is not adequate. It can only preserve or sustain a condition no longer acceptable. We must break through, and how are we going to do it? only by the same means that the old Rosicrucians advocated, 
and that is the rise of the people as a unit, each one by supporting the others of his own kind and type, bringing about a bloodless, a non-militant reformation, a reformation which depends upon the inevitable fact that leadership must abide by the will of the people. If the public requires, the thing will be accomplished. But the voice of the people must be a clear, united statement of need, and not an occasional voice silenced by its own kind. If we are frightened over the uh, dangers of bad leadership, we must remember that a very large part of the persecution of progress arises from the level which should be supporting progress, that is, the level of the average person. If, then, the problem of pansophic education confronted the mystic of the 16th and 17th century, he, is, he was then stating what we still know, Namely, that we cannot have an adequate education until religion, philosophy, and science are reconciled, and that out of their common union must arise the enlightened person, not merely the well-schooled individual or the one surpassing in knowledge and skill, but the enlightened person, for no person is truly educated until he is also dedicated. He has to have a sense of mission. Education must bring with it dedication to right use of knowledge and total use of knowledge. Education that leads only to a concept of private profit can never be considered true education. It must lead to a strong pressure toward the public good. This point was clearly brought out by Comenius, who created within the very structure of Rosicrucianism, for he was one of the early names associated with it, the great need for the complete break between the education of the Dark Ages the educational theories of the Renaissance and the educational need of the modern world. That no matter what the price, the salvation of the world depended upon the enlightened man. There was no evasion in this particular problem, no compromise, no possibility of creating a group of enlightened who would lead the rest. No way in which leadership could take the place of the enlightenment of the citizen himself, because it is only the enlightened citizen who can recognize an enlightened leader, and it is only a dedicated citizen who will sacrifice his personal interests to protect an enlightened leader. You cannot get away from the fact that we cannot elect and maintain that which is better than ourselves. Somewhere compromise comes in. Somewhere we betray the very leadership which we have established. So Comenius began the process of the universal reformation of mankind in the mother school where the children gathered at the knee of their parent and at two or three years of age, began to understand the values. This had to be the way it started. The child had to be constantly in the presence of the example of right value. And the moment this is compromised, the moment this perspective is lost, the whole progress of mankind is threatened. So the early, early Rosicrucians certainly developed their concept of a school of religious indoctrination or instruction. 
But it was no longer to be the old way. It was to be religion working in the life of the person. And worship was now to be constructive work for common good. The value of prayer was important. It was a good thing for man to get down on his knees and pray, but much better for all concerned if he'd get up on his feet and work. And it was to get man onto his feet and to get the prayer off of his lips and into his heart and to get the motivation out of the church and into a business to get religion established as a working basis of successful enterprise. These were the problems, and this old organization did its best to cope with them. Now, as might be well imagined, the dilution of the original idea began almost immediately. It was as though this society was a person, uh, destined to meet the same fate that came to Savonarola and Giordano Bruno. These great liberals died for their ideals, and the Society of the Rosy Cross also gradually died or disappeared from the public observation of men because humanity would not accept the challenge could not, probably, certainly did not. Gradually, the secret motives of the organization were reinterpreted. Little by little, the ideals were compromised until the main project, which was the improvement of all men, disappeared in a kind of strangely exclusive circle of unknown persons who were supposed to possess extraordinary knowledge. This was not the original intention. And as a result, by the middle of the 17th century, the great era of the manifestos closed. And from that time on, for more than a hundred years, almost nothing was known of the Society of the Rosy Cross. Its landmarks gradually vanished away. The public mind turned to other attitudes and purposes, and the great march of humanism continued. After approximately a century, in the, about the middle of the 18th century, there was a tremendous revival of older beliefs. There was the great period of France digging into the ruins of Egypt and producing a whole school of French art, essentially Greek and Egyptian. There were revivals of ancient learning in many levels and a restoration or reappearance of what was assumed to be the Rosicrucian position. A new order of Rosicrucians came into existence, claiming to have knowledge of the original purposes of the society. Now, however, this new organization belonged to a level of scientific dilettantism and was, for the most part, sterile. There were, however, certain mystical groups who preserved and continued the old struggle. And in this interesting and critical period, there came into existence or into manifestation a manuscript that was circulated around among mystical groups and fraternities, uh, and which some years ago we published under the title of the Codex Rosicrucis. This was a manuscript consisting of a number of hieroglyphically and figuratively illuminated pages or leaves. And at the beginning was the simple statement that this was an ABC book for young students studying in the school of the Holy Spirit. This was associated not only with the Rosicrucians, 
but also with the pietist movement. And the pietists, when they came to America, brought these manuscripts and similar material into Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And here they founded such organizations as the Brotherhood of the Mustard Seed and the Order of the Woman in the Wilderness. These extremely devout pietistic people were devoted to one thing alone, one purpose alone, and that was that religious conviction should govern every act of conduct and that there should be no departure from the simple devotion to principle and truth and integrity. The pietists uh, made a slight dent upon our American way of life and uh, have gradually come down to us through a series of more recent movements, of which perhaps the Friends and the Quakers are the most um, obvious. If you go back into Europe, however, you will find that the persons responsible for the rise of quietism of the Quakers and these other mystical groups were also involved in this early pattern of Rosicrucian research. Many different organizations with different purposes stemmed from this parent conviction, this absolute need for the establishment of a way of life dedicated to the daily practice of truth. So we have now this problem of the student studying in the school of the Holy Spirit. Obviously, he couldn't go to class. Obviously, his studies had to be internalized by means of certain tracts and manuscripts and records and traditions and oral communications, a level of idealism, much, of that, uh, much like that of Eckert Chaucer, as represented in his work, The Cloud on the Sanctuary. This mysticism had to do with the visualization of the restoration of the kingdom of heaven upon earth. It was the fact that man must build his own spiritual world. He must create for himself a paradise on earth, and in so doing must merit divine grace. It was the principle of the pietists and also of the mystics of the 17th century that all good things had to be earned. They took that position firmly upon the law of cause and effect, and that is one of the reasons they were later regarded as strongly philosophical organizations. They affirmed that individually and collectively, Man must merit the salvation that he seeks, that he must become a witness, that he must make his own offering, that he must prove his own conviction, and must indicate that he is willing to dedicate himself unreservedly to the good thing which he longs to achieve. If he is not willing to make this personal dedication, then there is no evidence that he is able to conceive of the nature of divine grace. So with the Protestant Reformation, there came this strong feeling in the public mind. And this feeling has survived to us today. And it has still carried its old message that religion is a kind of school, that the individual goes to religion not merely to listen but to learn, that he goes not only to be comforted but to be improved, that he goes not only to be inspired but to be directed into a practical way of life suitable to protect the society of which he is a part. This means that religion must be a kind of over-university, or as Comenius and uh, several other, uh, including Schweikahart, 
one of the early Rosicrucian masters, called the Universal College or the Pansophic College. Here the individual must realize that he is going to school to learn all things knowable. That religion is to lead him into every department of knowledge necessary for his own integration. And that every preacher must be a teacher. That every sect must carry spiritualized education. That this education shall not merely be thundering upon the importance of dogma, but shall be fitting the individual to live his principles clearly, effectively, and continuously. It is pretty obvious that under such a program, there would still be much to be achieved in order to bring the world to the ideal state that these mystics envision. They envisioned a world united, not under science or philosophy, but essentially under religion. But they also fully realized that before this could happen, great things had to occur in religion. The religion of their time did not have the scope or the breadth or the understanding to occupy such an exalted position. Consequently, all knowledge must be distilled, the spirit discovered, its gross parts refined, its limitations overcome, its restrictions of concept transmuted, until finally religion in substance represented the soul and spirit of all else. That everything has a religious value. That not only is every action of man essentially a moral action. Every trade, science, and art teaches some phase of religion. And the practice of any branch of learning requires religious insight if the individual is to practice wisely and well. Thus religion becomes the common source of conduct and the basis by which we estimate the value of everything else. Now such a concept of religion is not ours. It is not generally so held today. But in those times these mystics realized by inner experience something that we have never been able as yet to fully experience objectively. As they sought within themselves for spiritual consolation, they came personally to the experience of the universality of God. The mystic was the first to experience or to record the total impact of the divine purpose upon the consciousness of individuals. The mystic did not experience God as a person. He did not experience the divine will as an edict. The mystic experienced God as universal life, love, wisdom, moving in upon him and bestowing the benediction of its presence upon him. The mystic recognized, therefore, the total impact of spirit upon matter, of life upon form, of truth upon the confusion of the world we know, and of total wisdom upon total ignorance. The mystic could not and would not accept uh, the boundaries which man imposed upon religious thinking. To the mystic, the idea of one department of learning being sacred and another secular was impossible. He could not recognize it as such for the reason that he regard as, regarded as religious any circumstance, condition, or process 
in which sacred values were evident. And as he looked about him and looked within him, he could see nothing from the growing of the seed in the ground to the work of the good shoemaker or to the kindly service of the wise physician. He could discover nothing anywhere in which God was not present. And he beheld the fact that the fullness, goodness, and realization of all things, these values were present because of the divinity in all things. Thus, and as early as the early 17th century, these mystics recognized the possibility of a total fraternity of living things, that all creation could unite to bear witness to the all-creating power which manifested through all, all creations, not through one more than another, but was the total source of the total effect. Thus to them man lived in a sacred world. No part was more sacred than another. There was nothing less sacred in being a grocer than there was in being a priest. All things were by nature divine. Consequently, man became the universal steward, the servant in the eternal house. And it was man's attitude to all the things which he did and all the possessions which he had and all the situations that arose that determined the future of the world. Unless this attitude was essentially one of dedication, world affairs could never go well, and there would be no end to war, disturbance, strife, strife, crime, sin, and death. To meet this emergency, then, a total education had to be provided. An education which carried all things beyond skill to principle. And we find these mystics advocating the establishment of immutable principles and that all things should be judged by these principles and that all conduct should be measured by these principles and that no individual should expect any circumstance in life which was contrary to laws moving from principles. Thus the idea of a pansophic college was a system of education leading the individual step by step through the maze of phenomena to the cause of phenomena, from the diversity of the world to the unity of truth, from the numerous interests and activities of constant ag activity and agitation to the silence and quietude of the cause of all action, which is within the divine nature itself. These people then were gradually enlarging a concept of God. God was no longer just a being inhabiting a remote region. God was actually the archetype of the ends men sought. Deity was the perfection of all things not yet complete. Deity was the principal goal and end in that the understanding of God implied man's obedience to that which he understood. God was therefore now not only divine law but universal procedure. God was not an isolated being. He not only surrounded and held his creation within himself, but he permeated all of that creation. And the great endeavor was to try to discover God in those things long rejected, criticized, or condemned. Where men began to accept this and reject that, they divided God. Where they loved some and hated others, they divided God. And by their own ignorance, they set up divisions in the world. The wise man must therefore repair division. 
He must discover good in that wherein it is not obvious. And wherever, through his own conduct, he has created corruption, he must correct that corruption. For it is his own conduct and not the universe that is responsible for his misfortune. Thus the process of removing uh, the odium of original sin from the divine will began to develop. It was no longer God's will that his creatures should be miserable. It was God's will or purpose that his creatures should abide in security through the keeping of the law. Therefore, it was man and not God who was responsible for the inferiorness of our way of life. It was not the divine plan that we should uh, remain here and engage, as Europe did, in nearly 8,000 wars. These things were not due to the divine will. They were due to man's departure from the plan and his gradual cutting off of his own internal insight. Man began to live on the outside of himself. He no longer used the bridges that led him inward to the consolation of the spirit. Isolated not only from the God in the universe, but from the God in himself, he therefore fell truly upon evil times. The purpose of mysticism and of the great concept of the new education was that man should restore his contact with total being, total life, and total good, and that he should recognize that science, religion, and philosophy are not institutions in themselves to be defended. They are means by which the common good shall be attained. Loyalty is not due to them, but to the principle which they seek to discover. All institutions are mortal, subject to the fallacies of flesh and error. Man should not be true to his institutions, but to his principles. And he should use his institutions and revise them, so that they will be bridges leading to his conscious understanding of principles. Education is not important in itself. It is important for the end which it bestows. If it fails to bestow that end, then it has totally failed. And the preservation of the institution is of no importance. The end, of course, is that man shall discover his own orientation in a universe of love, truth, wisdom, and law. To understand these things and to accept them, according to the concept of Rosicrucian mysticism, was, therefore, the entire educational procedure in the school of the Holy Spirit. Now this school, as the texts themselves and other commentations tell us, sounds strange because it invited grown-up people, some of them long in years, to go back again to their ABCs. Sometimes the thought arose why should it be uh, that we should have to begin again, go back not only to the trade schools and the universities, but become abecedarians? That is, to go back to the learning of our letters, go back to the kind of education that began when we were five or six years old. The answer that the... Uh, pan-sophists and the Rosicrucians gave was that we must go back to the point where error began and we must correct it there. And error began the moment we began to learn that which was not so. And what we call education is usually or very largely uh, diluted with things that are not so. Now a thing may be a crime by omission or by commission. Perhaps the crime in education up to the date, up to the present time, has been a crime of omission. 
No one can deny that the child must learn its letters and that the three classic R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, are essential to our way of life. But even in the beginning, there were these omissions, these failures to include in education that which is most important. And from the beginning, a false emphasis upon the end to be attained. Education cannot achieve its true purpose unless its reason for existence is included in its earliest presentation. And these mystics probably followed the original concepts of Christianity and believed that only the child could find easily the way to the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, each person becoming a mystic became a child again, began to live and learn all over again, began to discriminate even in childhood between levels of values and gained the most powerful of all educational skills, namely that of resolutely clinging to the good. So before man got very far with reading and writing, he must begin to understand the nature of good. He must understand his place, his responsibility, and must be gradually taught to look forward to this responsibility, not as a burden, but as a fulfillment. Bamey pointed out that it is the first burden of the plant that it shall ultimately flower and bear its seed. But that this flowering and the bearing of the seed is not a burden, not a disaster, but a fulfillment. That in so doing, the plant reveals the greatest splendor of itself and becomes so beautiful that we use these flowers to decorate the altars of our God. Therefore, the fulfillment of the fruitfulness of the soul is not a burden, but is the glorious opportunity to fully express ourselves, not only for our own fulfillment, but perhaps for the wonder and admiration of others. Thus the child learning at the beginning of education, the real purpose of knowledge, gains with it an insight into what is honorable, what is purposeful, what is necessary. And this insight must come for no individual who is taught to be skillful without at the same time being so totally inspired to be good that this becomes the total concern of his life. No individual not so indoctrinated can safely be regarded as a citizen of a world of constructive, progressive people. So this school of the Holy Spirit began again the education of man. It taught man, for example, the truth of the concept that to conquer self is greater than to take a city. The school of the Holy Spirit then indoctrinated man with self-discipline, imposing the rulership of himself over himself, reminding him that when he attempts to rule others, he is a tyrant. But when he attempts to rule himself, he is wise. And to the degree that he achieves this self-rulership, he is virtuous. However, before we can rule ourselves or impose laws upon ourselves, we must know these laws. We must have some understanding as to the procedures to be followed. Thus, our religious life must be under pattern sufficiently real and valid so that we will not outgrow them and will not ultimately find that they conflict with our own integrity. All this learning called for a re-evaluation of knowledge in all of its parts. And this was the Rosicrucian idea behind the great encyclopedia. 
in which the essential knowledge of man could be communicated to man. It was also assumed by this order in several of its manifestos that the body of knowledge greatly exceeded in weight the soul of knowledge. That today man is not making proper use of the faculties for the acquiring of knowledge. He is making a vast labor out of learning. He is spending perhaps some of the best years of his life in a desperate effort to get an education. He is doing this at tremendous expense to himself and others and a very heavy burden upon the state. What then is the answer? And from their beginnings, the Rosicrucians and the other Illuminists of the time conceived that education could be reduced to a series of essential formulas. That education could be in the form of a very neat kit of tools, suitable to be applied to almost any project. That it was actually not necessary for man to learn the rules of each art and science separately. This was because he had not discovered that a universal pattern underlies them all. If man could discover this basic pattern, he would become very largely informed on nearly all particulars by the mastery of one basic formula. That this formula would not be, of course, merely a phrase is understood. But that if this formula could be devised into a concise structure, and this structure could be essentially regarded as the root of education, that in all probabilities the things that the average person needs to know in every department of his activity could be markedly reduced. Also with this would be a marked tendency for man to understand other men. If we could find the common denominator of law, medicine, architecture, biology, and physics, so that in the learning of one, we gain an apperception of the others, we would not have so many different branches of learning locked away behind barriers of terminology and restricted interests. Now some will say that might have been possible in the 17th century, but no longer, because of the tremendous advancement in sciences and the increasing complication therein. These older thinkers would have said the advancement we accept, but the complication we do not accept because complications only come to individuals who are deficient in principles. If the individual knew the fact in the first place, he would not fall into complexity. Complexity is fishing around for facts we should already know. The reason being that all facts are accessible. And the reason that we do not know most of them is not because they are unknowable, but because we do not possess the skill to recognize them. As a matter of simple truth, practically every fact that we have attained in the last hundred years has been available to us for the last 5,000 years. But we murdered and disposed of the people that had these facts first, we rejected them because they did not belong to our faith. We ignored them because they came from some other race. And we also neglected them because we divided fact from philosophy. And nearly every scientific fact we have has been long held as a philosophical truth. Thus, if we really harbored a universal attitude, and went to work with what is already available, we 
could smooth out many of the controversies that under present policies will continue for ages. We are not, therefore, actually in confusion because it is necessary, but because we have failed to establish values. We have in some cases anticipated our own ethics to such a degree that we have no rational or moral boundaries to curb our activities. We therefore fall into one disaster after another. Half the remedies that we ingeniously devise would not even be necessary if we had common sense in the first place. Today it is a part of our responsibility to spend much of our time and much of our resources taking care of the consequences of our own unenlightened way of conduct. If then we had a grasp of principles and were able to take hold of a total concept of education, we would not be problem today with atomic bombs or Sputniks or anything else. We would be actually moving toward the use of the application of energy to its legitimate ends instead of worrying about all the selfish, stupid little people who are going to abuse it. But because we have never had the basic system which made abuse unlikely or impossible, we have to go through an elaborate process of defending ourselves from the byproducts of our own ignorance. This means that a system must sometime be found. And this system must be a total concept of knowledge in which man is educated from within outwardly. That is, he is educated as a being first. And that this education, according to the Rosicrucian mysticism, is not actually the kind of schooling that we know. We can't send him to school and make him good. We can't send him to Sunday school and make him good. We can expose him to everything, but he still has a strange and mysterious power of remaining himself. Our answer lies on a different level. The only school, according to the old uh, Rosicrucians, was this College of the Holy Spirit, or the School of the Holy Ghost. And this was the uh, legend school that was based upon the earlier accounts that we had in the old Jewish lore that said that in the ancient times, before the fall of man, Adam and Eve went to school in the College of the Angels, and there they gained the knowledge by which Adam was able to name all creatures according to their natures, which we can't do. We name them according to our language only. We do not know the nature of any of them. But this idea of the school of the Holy Spirit was developed upon the concept that man by attaining a state of mysticism or mystical at one received the total impression of the divine will. He wasn't able to interpret it always. He wasn't able to apply it to everything immediately. But this school of the Holy Spirit was the school that bestowed upon him the factual internal vision of the great reality itself. It made him instantly a citizen of the cosmos rather than the citizen of a nation or a state. It made him a creature living in many worlds at once. It destroyed forever in him the possibility of provincialism. It also placed him in a state of consciousness in which the eternity of the world, the eternity of the life principle, the magnificent over-purpose of all things, 
these values were so strongly impressed upon his consciousness that this impression constituted essential education. Essential education was man's actual discovery and experience of the total power of life and wisdom, the total impact of the divine as absolute security if man attains it, and also a recognition of his own place as an instrument for the manifestation of an eternal fact. Having received this essential education in the school of the Holy Spirit, in which it becomes obvious to the inner life as an illumination or a mystical experience, that there can be no purpose apart from the divine purpose, then the individual can go to any college that he wills, learn any science or art that he wants to learn. He cannot be talked out of his inner life. Materialism cannot close upon him because he knows. And that which has actually occurred to himself cannot be taken from him by the arguments of others. Yet one argument which he has accepted may be taken from him by the argument of another. Thus the individual who has no footing in himself can be shifted to almost any other footing. The individual who has firmly and resolutely attained an internal insight has thereby schooled his inner life. And in this school of the inner life, God and the angels were reported to be the teachers. For this insight descends upon man from universal insight. And if he is still and accepts it, which is the key of mysticism, he is flooded with a divine experience which is undeniable and eternal. From that time on, the great decisions of life are made. And these decisions come not from knowledge, but from the internal enlightenment of the soul person thus enlightened finds it much happier and wiser to sacrifice all other things and follow that enlightenment. Compromise is no longer possible because compromise must depend upon ignorance. And the only end of ignorance is man's apperception of the experience of truth within himself. This, then, is the school of the Holy Spirit, the school which leads man to the inward discovery of God. Now, this does not conflict with his other schooling, but it gives vitality, reason, purpose, and direction to anything else that he does. Without this essential education, all incidental education fails. For without this essential dedication, the lawyer, the physician, the engineer, the tradesman, the builder, all of these persons, without this internal insight, lack the solid foundation of ethics upon which they must build in order that the things which they build and the services which they give shall ultimately unite to form the pattern of a better world. Man has neglected this, and of course it was neglected long before the mystical institutions of the 17th century became dust. But the need goes on, and the only answer to the division of worldly things is the unity of divine things. To experience this unity actually is to be bound eternally to it. But no intellectual or psychological conception of it is sufficient. So in the school of the Holy Spirit, man becoming again as a little child awaits with gentleness and receptivity the impact of the divine upon his own consciousness. 
he does become still and thereby knows. He does accept truth. And by acceptance, by the making of his own nature available, he is filled inwardly with that grace which will flow out through all the things that he does. From that time on, no world can ruin him. But without that, no system of human society can save him. For his salvation must be earned by the action of his own consciousness. This is the merit system which mysticism has always taught. And all religious mystery lies in man's ability to become humble, to become gentle, to become strongly uh, in the spirit of the divine humility. And by that means to become receptive to the experience of the divine purpose, the experience of the total plan of life for its creation. To achieve this is to thus become the graduate in the college of the Holy Spirit. And it is this degree uh, alone which is the highest of all honors. From that time on, the citizen becomes an instrument of progress. Today we are confronted with the same kind of problem that burdened the past. The individual accomplishing everything except the integration of himself, and as a result, sick, miserable, and weary. He lacks the courage to cast off his own ignorance. He lacks the simple spiritual impulse to be kind. He will be like the uh, famous Pharisee, kind to the one who is kind to him. But he has not yet the grace of spirit to be unmoved by the action of others and remain true to the principle of truth, beauty, love, and wisdom which he knows is right. Therefore, he continues to struggle, blame others, and live in a world less that he could inhabit. No one can save him from these negations except himself. And he must do it by the victory of true faith over fear and the victory of love over doubt. If he can hold these things, he will then experience the true education, which is this process of learning eternal while man still dwells in time. This learning of the eternal becomes the base of an eternal learning in man. And it is upon this learning that the peace of nations and the survival of worlds must depend. Time's up. <laughs> now we've got several problems that we must bring to your attention. Next week, we're going to speak on the golden verses of Pythagoras. This is one of the great monuments of antiquity, and we think you will find it of value and interest. We have a little booklet on the riddle of the rosy cross, which you might be interested in securing, and also a copy of Jennings' rather chaotic but most interesting work, The Rosicrucians, Their Rites and Mysteries. Also a copy of a rather rare occult novel, Miriam and the Mystic Brotherhood, which has been long out of print. However, we'd like to especially point out at this time, as you must be planning your Christmas shopping, the importance of securing a Christmas card or small gift, which you probably will have to do. And we recommend uh, that our little booklet, our new booklet this year, The Christmas Message, be considered for this purpose. Through the uh, use of this booklet, which will form either a nice, a very nice card or a small gift, you may pass on to your friends something of inspiration and value. Uh, the Christmas message which we prepared this year is written for a particular purpose. It is not essentially 
a restatement of the traditional Christian or Christmas story. What we are trying to do with it is to help the disillusioned person to find again the child heart for Christmas, to find again something that will give him a little experience in this school of the Holy Spirit something to restore in him the power to be beautiful at this time and through this experience to find the beauty of this season. I think it is something that you could give friends of many beliefs and many ages without misunderstanding or without causing any religious conflict. It is simply an effort to help the individual to find beauty and truth and happiness in a situation that in recent years has become a burden on his spirit. To get rid of that sense of burden. And to see in everything that happens another opportunity to grow and to be a better and more constructive person. Anyway, we think it's an important point, particularly with the heavy pressures of our commercialized relationship to holidays today. We hope that you will find it helpful and useful and hope that you will use it as a Christmas gift to your friends. Also, uh, books and magazines make good Christmas presents, so we hope you will do some of your shopping at our book tables to help us to carry on our activity. And don't forget, next Sunday morning, we're going to speak on the golden verses of Pythagoras. Thank you very much.